So uh, welcome, friends, to the last session of this uh, extraordinary meeting. Uh, and uh, it's my privilege to be in conversation here with, uh, uh, with uh, one of the great heroines of free speech in America. Uh, first, I should probably introduce myself, because I don't know everyone uh, in the room. I'm Michael McConnell. I teach constitutional law uh, at Stanford Law School. and. I'm director of the Constitutional Law Center there. I, I, by the way, I do teach the course at Stanford on, on free speech and press and the freedom of religion. So I think that's why they uh, 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 recruited me to, uh, uh, to engage with Nadine today. But Nadine is the star of the show. Uh, and she, uh, in, in terms of her, of her uh, professional accomplishments, uh, she was uh, president of the ACLU for 17 turbulent and successful <laughs> years. Uh, she was the first, both the first woman and the youngest president ever of the ACLU. She replaced a mutual friend of ours, yeah. Norman Dorson from NYU Law School, who was a real saint and a, also a, a hero. But, but it isn't uh, Nadine's professional record or accomplishments that makes me say what I said at the beginning about uh, her role in America. Um, it is that she, she's fulfilled a, a place which is, which once I think was kind of understood, but now is under uh, extraordinary pressure and strain. And that is defending people with whom you disagree. Um, one of the extraordinary things which has uh, happened to the culture of the United States, of the West in general, but especially uh, of the United States, uh, is uh, a, a, a sense that freedom of speech ceases to be a, a principle uh, and has become a tool. It's become a political tool so that if we like what someone is going to say, we defend their freedom of speech you know, to the to hilt. If we don't like what they're going to say, silence them, deplatform them. It, Michael, uh, it's even worse. If we don't like what they say, we say it's violence. Yes, it's not yes, speech. It's, it's not even speech. It isn't even speech. And, and this is especially virulent on American campuses, but it's, I think, moving into the culture. So it's also the social media has, uh, has done this. And, and Nadine, to her enormous credit, has uh, stood steadfastly against this. So we don't talk politics very often. I mean, we've known each other mm -hmm. for, what, 15, 20 years. We don't really talk politics. We talk law and speech. But I'm guessing that Nadine and I don't agree on a lot of it, well, and in fact, Michael, uh, I, it, I looked up our interactions, and they go back to the early 90s, and we've actually debated each other as often as we have been wow. on the same side. And um, unfortunately, students are becoming more and more surprised. How can you have a polite conversation with somebody you so strongly disagree with on some issues? This is not to be taken for granted anymore. And so it is, you know, really my pleasure to be able to engage with Nadine today, primarily on the subject of her new book uh, on these topics, because she's the real deal, right? When you, uh, when you want to know what a civil libertarian really is, civil libertarians are not people who don't have politics. They, they have their own ideas, but they uh, believe in the liberty of others to have their ideas as well as equal citizens of this uh, uh, of this republic. So Nadine has recently uh, published a book called Hate, uh, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. And so why don't you just tell us what the basic thesis is of your book? And I see you have a Stanford Library copy, so I'm <laughs> going to have to send you my very own, your very own copy, Michael. Well, please, 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 <laughs> please sign it for me. Thank you I for supporting libraries. Copy. I love it. Uh, well, it's really an, an honor to be here with my longtime colleague, Michael McConnell, with, with whom I have shared so many podiums on, uh, mostly on a uh, range of First Amendment issues. And it's really such a special opportunity to address this important organization and 
all of you individuals and the organizations that you represent. I uh, took the opportunity to look at information about you and I was so delighted that in your mission statement of a small handful of principles, one of them completely dovetails with the whole thesis of my book, which is uh, conveyed very well by the title, if I say so, uh, hate why <laughs> we should resist it with free speech, not censorship. Yes, we must resist hatred and stereotyping and discrimination, and by the way, of all sorts, because people now, unfortunately, are being rampantly subject to discrimination and stereotyping and various kinds of social and other penalties, not only based on who they are, their identities, but also based on what they believe, their ideas. Uh, there is so much discrimination and categorization and ostracization. Uh, and I absolutely oppose government or official censorship or even censorship by uh, those who wield enormous power in the private sector, uh, particularly social media companies. Of course I recognize that they have a constitutional right to determine their own policies, but I believe we have a really important responsibility to persuade them to use that enormous power in ways that uh, promote free speech and free exchange of ideas. Just as I oppose official silencing, I support efforts to reduce hateful attitudes, certainly to reduce hateful conduct and discriminatory and violent conduct through civil society. And so I was really delighted to see that one of your general mission statements is the belief and the commitment and putting your money and your expertise and your ideas and all of your tangible in, and intangible resources in the service of promoting various um, positive outcomes for society and believing that the civil sector can do that more effectively than government can. And so, Michael, this is something that I've been writing about and preaching about forever. I became involved with the ACLU shortly upon graduating from law school a long time ago. I'm even more mature than you are, Michael. I looked up your birth date. And so... Uh, <laughs> You'd have to look at our birth dates because looking at our faces would never give you a clue. Uh, the ACLU was embroiled um, shortly after I got out of law school in a controversy that in which my mentor, Norman Dorson, to whom uh, Michael alluded, was then the national president of the ACLU, and I co-dedicated the book to him and the executive director of the ACLU at the time, R.A. Nyer. But if I just say one word, I think most of you will know what I'm talking about. Skokie. Uh, the ACLU, in this was 1977, and there was a group of neo-Nazis that were seeking to demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, a town near Chicago that contained not only a large Jewish population, but at that time, a very high number of Holocaust survivors. And the ACLU, despite completely opposing the ideas and the agenda of the neo-Nazis, came to the defense of their free speech rights. That was an uncontroversial position in terms of fundamental legal principles in this country. Basically, that government may never suppress speech solely because the ideas are hated or hateful. Uh, yes, speech may be punished and should be when in a particular context, it directly causes or threatens certain imminent specific serious harms, such as intentional incitement of imminent violence or targeted harassment or bullying or a genuine threat that's aimed at a small group of people uh, that reasonably fear that they are imminently going to be subject to violence. But none of those situations uh, obtained in the Skokie case, so the ACLU um, won this case resoundingly in the courts of law, including the United States Supreme Court. Let, let me just throw in yeah. something just yeah. to emphasize how clear this was as a matter of 
constitutional yeah. doctrine because I was a law clerk for William J. Brennan, Brennan yeah. Jr., the uh, liberal and civil libertarian icon, and he did a television interview oh. shortly after the Skokie matter in which he was asked, well, you know, how, how can you, you know, defend the right of these Nazis to be marching in the, you know, through a neighborhood inhabited by Holocaust survivors? And uh, he gave a six-word answer, and his answer was, actually, it's a nine-word answer. I can't count. The First Amendment, the First Amendment, the First Amendment. Wow. Wow. And um, although we resoundingly won in the court of courts of law, including the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, it was a bloodbath in the court of public opinion, including even among ACLU members ourselves. Uh, a full 15% of card-carrying ACLU members resigned their membership in protest. And I like to point that out when I'm asked, as Michael recently asked me, are things worse now? Are people more hostile to free speech, including ideas that they hate, than they have been in the past? And, you know, I tend to be, as an activist, you have to be an optimist, so I tend to see the glass half full, and so I say, well, you know, we, these problems are perennial. After all, if you have even die-hard free speech supporters who, you know, are committed enough to pay the membership dues. I know we're not supposed to campaign for organizations, but I do have to mention the membership dues are only $20, <laughs> but still, it's a commitment. If you have even 15, even 15 but percent of, sorry. You, you may not want to answer this one, <laughs> yeah. uh, Nadine, yeah, I but do. I, it does, I have wondered whether the ACLU would take the same position today. Yeah, yeah. and that's uh, a, My that's, impression, yeah. especially that there's an age yes, gap exactly. going on within ACLU ranks with people yeah. you know, closer yeah. to our generation yeah. still seem to have a fire in their belly for freedom of speech. And, and but the an younger generation a, tends, yeah. I think, to be more into the social justice it's, ideology. It's an excellent question, Michael. And so I was going to go to the glass. <laughs> More empty, but hopefully all of the initiative and support here will, will refill it in terms of free speech, which is um, what to me is different about the challenges now is not the national leadership of the ACLU or uh, by and large leadership in um, what, organizations and institutions that you would expect to support free speech, whether it be libraries, universities, uh, media, and so forth. But people who work with all of these institutions have told me, it's anecdotal, but there are a lot of anecdotes, uh, that there is a generational divide, that the young people who are coming in uh, just do not come in. It's not only lacking the fire in the belly, Michael, uh, but lacking basic understanding and basic knowledge. I am a firm believer, and this gets back to why I wrote the book, uh, that a lot of the hostility to free speech reflects m sheer misunderstanding. Misunderstanding about what the principles are, misunderstanding about the history, misunderstanding what the present consequences. So I am a firm believer that um, I guess in the marketplace of ideas, of course, truth is not always going to out, but I have actually seen in my own advocacy that uh, many people, young people, say to me that their minds were changed as a result of being exposed to certain basic information. In terms of the ACLU, uh, yes, I'm uh, not at all embarrassed that there's debate and dissent within the organization. I would be embarrassed if there were not. Um, and I hope you all know that the ACLU did pull another Skokie in 2017. We defended the free speech rights, the First Amendment rights uh, of assembly and protest and expression of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I don't know if you've seen, there's been a lot of coverage of protest and controversy within the organization itself. As I remember, the I think it was the Virginia head of the ACLU, it the ACLU was a very decentralized, of, was shouted down, yes. deplatformed at yes. University Will, of Virginia, College of it? William and Mary. 
and it very, very sad because she had gone there. So this was protest against the ACLU for non-ACLU members. Um, within the ACLU itself, there's been a lot of protest, and I do, before I, I tell you about that incident, um, the ACLU, as a result, under the leadership of the national, I'm so sorry, I'm not supposed to talk about organizations, but it's kind, kind of emblematic that um, there is a renewed commitment, but it's still very controversial, and I'm going to switch gears because I don't want to talk so, about organizations. So let me ask, but may, can let I me ask you a different yeah, question yeah. to get away from the organization yeah. itself. Yeah. So, so the, uh, the language used, especially on college campuses yeah. and in the social media uh, uh, disputes, is, is a language now of safety. Yes. And so students, yes. what would you do? Let's say a, a student comes up to you and says, uh, you know, this, this, there's going to be this, you know, terrible speaker mm -hmm. coming to my campus, mm -hmm. and I don't feel safe. I feel threatened yes. by by this. Yes. Can, what and, would and, be and what would be your answer? To it, such and a and Michael, I do want to give a few examples of where this has happened recently. I mean, uh, because in the last week alone, it's just been day after day after day. Every morning I start. At 3.19 in the morning, you too can get your emailed version of the Inside Higher Education, which is just filled with violations of, of free speech. And today's edition being no exception, uh, so these are incidents that probably happened yesterday, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, somebody, a former head of some immigration um, office within the Department of Homeland Security was supposed to be speaking at the University of Pennsylvania, and interestingly enough, the protest was outside the room where the speaker was trying to talk, but the shouts were so loud and so amplified that the whole event had to be canceled. And in the coverage of, the, of this event, uh, student leaders of the protest uh, I mean, because the interviewer was saying, but don't you think it would be really important to have the opportunity to have a debate about the controversial policies and ideas that you're protesting? And a number of students that they quoted actually said that you are committing an assault, you are endangering me by inviting this person. So it's now even one step removed from uh, the speech itself is a danger, but even to invite the speaker and this inability. And to engage in debate with the speaker is to legitimize exactly. that exactly. speaker. Exactly, exactly. That's not just an attack on the speaker, that's actually an attack on the very idea of disagreement and debate. And it's even now an attack, something that's come to light in the past week, although I think it happened a bit earlier, even one step removed in journalists daring to report on different perspectives. My alma mater, uh, Harvard, has not been at the vanguard of defending free speech and open inquiry. And um, the latest example, although this is not from the university officially, but from many students, including student journalists on the Harvard Crimson, in, this, in September, there was a protest against ICE policies, immigration and customs enforcement. Obviously, I defend the right to protest, uh, the, but here's the problem that arose. The Harvard Crimson, the daily student newspaper, was reporting on the protest after the fact and in cons uh, consistent with very elaborate policies they have that are consistent with uh, journalistic ethics and student journalistic ethics, they reached out to ICE for comments. And this led to a torrent of protest and a petition, um, and, uh, and it has led to a boycott of the Harvard Crimson because they are endangering undocumented students and other members of traditionally marginalized groups on campus, according to the protesters, simply by asking ICE to comment. And the boycott has come to fruition. The boycott consists in not only not getting copies or reading it, but refusing to be interviewed 
by journalists at the Crimson until they adopt a policy that they will no longer legitimize um, hateful policies and positions, including by agencies of the United States government. So an example that I read about a couple of days ago was um, students who were campaigning for Elizabeth Warren on campus, I assume this has nothing to do with her official campaign organization, uh, were asked to comment on something she had said recently and they refused to speak to the Crimson. And there are a whole host of student organizations that are taking this stance now. So the ripple effects in terms of shutting down information are just uh, mind boggling. Well, on that cheerful note, uh, <laughs> it, we, it is time to turn to some questions from the uh, audience. And our first question uh, is uh, going to be from uh, Lillian Corral. Uh, from the Knight Foundation, who has so generously supported this uh, affair. Hello. Oh, there we are. Hi, Nadine. Thanks so much, and thanks, Michael, for moderating that. Um, I'm Lillian Corral with the Knight Foundation, and as many of you or some of you may know, we um, one of our core beliefs is also in the, the freedom of expression and in the values that are espoused in the First Amendment. and. Nadine, as you, especially with young people, one of the things that we at night do is serve, we, we've done extensive surveying of young people, high schoolers and college students around their own beliefs in this area, and there does seem to be a lot of divide. Um, and then uh, th there actually seems to be some apprehension, I would say, right? Like they're just not sure at some point whether you, um, w the trade-off between inclusivity, frankly, and freedom of expression. Um, and. W with regards to social media platforms, I mean, what are some solutions that, because these are the platforms that these, um, th these young people are at. That, that is where a lot of the, the sort of the pre-event, um, pre-invitation chatter begins. What are some solutions that you think, you talked about civil society, that, that the civ civil society can sort of take on. What are some ideas for helping to create a more welcoming environment for helping to even share some of the basic facts that you described that people just don't even have um, as they're entering into this debate. Thank you so much, Lillian, and, and thanks for the, the wonderful work that you're supporting here. I didn't really even get to the thesis of my book, which is <laughs> that just as censorship is even more ineffective than I had thought, because I had about 15 to 20 years when I wasn't following the actual track record of censoring hate speech around the world. Uh, and at best, it's ineffective and at worst, it's counterproductive. But I was on the positive side. I am so much more encouraged about other steps we can take, including what lawyers often call counter speech. It's not a legal term of art, but it basically means any way that we can exercise our free speech rights to counter ideas that we think are wrong-headed, misguided, discriminatory, and to further other ideas. And you know, lest a critic be tempted to say, oh, that's only words. Well, let's not forget, hateful speech is also only words. And I do happen to believe that speech is powerful, but I've really seen a lot of evidence. So, um, for example, I went back and reread um, stories or articles that had been written by the groundbreaking law professors um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s who were the first ones who crusaded for hate speech codes on college campuses. And I was so struck by the emphasis they put on the failure, the absence of supportive speech. In those days, you didn't have what you have now which is leaders of the campus community speaking out to condemn hateful ideas, speaking up in favor of the rights and dignity of people who are disparaged. And uh, so not only their articles, but studies that have been done by social scientists and narratives by people who have been subject to hate speech it show that simply having people like us and the more of a leadership position you have, the better. But even in everyday life, you know, affirming values of, uh, of equality and dignity and inclusivity is very, very powerful. 
Uh, when you have university presidents doing that, student body presidents, that's really, really important. Um, I read an example today of a university, uh, two universe, a tale of two presidents on two different campuses. Um, one president responded to an incident of hate speech that clearly is constitutionally protected, but the president so cravenly supported the university police arresting and criminally charging two students who were drunk in the middle of the night and they, they said to themselves, you know, two words that were extremely offensive, but to criminally prosecute them without any attention to free speech values. And guess what? It didn't stoke the fan, the, the fuel of controversy. You know, you encourage um, further silencing and further demands, and that's, there's a lot of turmoil going on on that campus. Whereas another president who was asked to respond to a similar incident the same way responded immediately by saying, it's protected speech, but we were, so there's absolutely no question that there's going to be no punishment here, but there are a lot of other things that we can do in an educational vein, including having debates, having lectures, having seminars, you know, um, opportunities for students to engage ideas with each other, and that campus is much more peaceful. So, you know, and, and one of the things that organizations can do um, is to provide role models, right? I saw a recent publication that I think is terrific uh, that does pull together examples for leaders in different communities, including in the social media context. So I'm talking now about the campus context, but what a president can do, what students can do, what faculty members can do, and it has examples of the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, here's what you should not do, here's what you should do. In the social media, I have to say, I've certainly um, issued my share of criticism to policies that I don't like, including sensorial policies, but to their credit, the social media companies as well as foundations and universities have been uh, aggressively financing counter speech efforts on their media, right? It's only a means of communication. We can use it at least as much for good as for ill. And the initiatives are so encouraging in terms of proactive ed, uh, education and information, in terms of bridge building, uh, dialogues. There are really moving examples of something that I personally have never had the patience to do, and I just really marvel at the people who do, which is they get online to engage in sustained discussion with individuals who are either flirting with hateful ideas or indeed are already confirmed leaders of uh, discriminatory organizations. And to take an example that's been in the media quite a lot recently, Megan Phelps Roper has a new book. It came out within the past couple of weeks called Unfollow My uh, Life, My Lo Loving and Leaving the Westboro Baptist Church, um, whose philosophy is summarized by its website uh, www.godhatesfads.org. And Megan was born into this church that basically thought that, believes that God hates just about everybody except those who belong to the church. And um, she was raised in it. She was the, the heir apparent. She, as a young person, um, was the vanguard in the church's social media presence. So she went on to Twitter in order to recruit people to her church. And lo and behold, she is <coughs> recruited away through the intervention, interestingly enough, of uh, an Orthodox Jew uh, was uh, the key interlocutor. And ultimately, she was weaned away. And you, you know, I am absolutely convinced that it takes a lot of patience. You can't do it by treating somebody as a criminal, as would happen in Europe. You can't do it by ostracizing and demonizing and stigmatizing, well, as too well, often happens Nadine, here. wouldn't you agree, though, that social media, which began as a very hopeful um, network for furthering communication, has become one of the most problematic uh, areas of social life? And I, Lillian, I think, was asking in part about whether whether uh, social media uh, should be treated as different in some way. I mean, in your book, you take the position mm -hmm. 
that although the social media companies as mm -hmm. private companies can do what they mm -hmm. want, mm -hmm. you would recommend to them something very similar to the, the actual legal rules that apply to the government. Yeah. Uh, you know, how far would you take that? So for example, you know, Facebook from the beginning has not uh, allowed nude pictures. Mm -hmm clearly constitutionally protected mm -hmm. under, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, in most contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a mistake? Let me, I have to put it in a larger context, Michael, because I think we're now in a real struggle for the future of this dominant media medium and uh, where another model is increasingly coming to the fore in China and even in Western Europe of government um, deputizing, well, you know, in China, the government straightforwardly takes over. Uh, and unfortunately, a number of the Chinese social media products are becoming much more popular with young people. And Facebook is only for us old dinosaurs, yeah, right? TikTok is Ex a Exactly. Product. And so that, you know, they have a very strong sensorial model. And I think we, I really support the point in Mark Zuckerberg's recent speech, which I recommend to everybody, in which he said, you know, I think that Facebook, and there may be business reasons for it, who knows, but I, I, I agree with the end result is that it becomes more important than ever for us to offer an alternative model which would prefer free speech and counter speech. Nobody's forcing you to look at nude pictures any more than you're forced to do it on the web as the Supreme Court held in uh, Reno versus ACLU. Uh, I totally support empowering users to make our own decisions about what, and to facilitate making our own decisions through abundant filtering technology and so forth. But um, to, and I, I want to go beyond U United States First Amendment law because it's really important, and this is a point that I wish would also be a source of much more education than it has been, that international human rights law, not European Court of Human Rights, not the domestic law of other countries, but international human rights law under the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is amazingly overlapping with U.S. free speech principles. Despite some language that's negative in uh, the covenant, it has been interpreted uh, so far in a way that very much maps the content neutrality principle that I mentioned earlier and the um, emergency principle. And David Kay, who is a law professor in California who is serving as the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression has done a couple terrific reports, one of which came out just a few days ago, in which he urges social media companies voluntarily to adhere to international human rights free speech principles, uh, precisely because that would make it easier for them to resist enormous government pressures from authoritarian governments all over the world. You can't just rely on the First Amendment. People will say, oh, U.S. exceptionalism. But if you root it in these international principles, that covenant has been ratified by 172 out of 195 uh, nations in the world. And Michael, I have to say, having known quite a bit about the subject, I really did not know how robustly and in what a pro-free speech uh, manner those principles had been interpreted. So strategically, I think it really is important to hold out for not just U.S. principles, but these are principles that the vast majority of the world's countries have subscribed to. Well, let's turn to some of the uh, other questions that have been put up through the uh, app. Uh, I've seen three different ones. They keep changing. Shall we go with the one with right here? Uh, near to my heart. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as a student of the founding, how close are we to a country, uh, as a country, to the founders' ideas surrounding and implementing the First Amendment? Is it important to look at <laughs> that context, which I take it to be the historical context of I've that document? I've got one of the most eloquent and persuasive advocates of taking that approach sitting right next to me, so I will defer to that judgment. Love this question. <laughs> and I would actually say, Michael, that in terms of free speech principles, uh, we are doing so well. 
this U.S. Supreme Court, divided as it is on so many other issues, is amazingly unanimous or has a very strong consensus on many, many contested free speech issues and is unanimous on the issue of protecting hateful ideas. Um, so the law is excellent, but it's the same dichotomy I referred to earlier with respect to Skokie. The public understanding is the problem, and I don't know if your study of the founding generation would show that same split between the, um, those who are making the law and those who are uh, the citizenry. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, 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 I don't know when there has been, uh, in at least in the history of the Supreme Court, a stronger, more consistent protection for free speech in the face of you know, a cultural shift which seems to be going the other way. It's really very odd. And, and I think that the major pressure that we're facing here is social pressure and is cultural, and it is palpable. I tell you, my students, and I've read surveys that show that they're typical of students and faculty around the country, they know they're not gonna be punished uh, literally by the school or by the law, although if you're at the University of Connecticut, beware, you might be criminally prosecuted. Uh, but fortunately, that's the exception. They are much more concerned about peer pressure. And, and people out there in society, are you gonna be kicked out of a restaurant? Are you gonna lose your job? Uh, is your life gonna be made intolerable by your neighbors, your employers, and your peers because they so strongly just hate what you say? Uh, so another question, what are some of the most successful methods of engagement or activism in promoting free speech? I think education, 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 information, and the more, uh, the younger the age at which the education starts for both teachers and students, the better, and the more concrete the tools are, the better. So actual exercises, actual models, I have, uh, speaking from great personal experience as well as some social science studies, one of the best ways to make people open-minded and respect free speech is for them to engage in debates. And that does not mean being a member of the debate team, although that's a great experience, but uh, starting at the youngest age, you have to give students and, and e either modeling it and or letting them model it, um, approach every idea, and here's the mantra I use for my law students. If I were teaching kindergarten, I would use the same mantra, maybe in somewhat different language, but uh, you have to be able to understand and articulate and advocate all plausible perspectives on all issues. There is no other way that you can learn how to think. In law school, we but all- are the schools doing this? I don't know, Michael. I'm not an expert. There have been, and so, it's really important that we encourage them. And if they're them. not, what can be done to nudge us back in that direction? I have been the beneficiary of participating in some programs that some organizations have done to bring in high school and middle school teachers for education and training and giving them resources. And you know, these are self-selected who are already interested in the, these ideas, but to um, encourage them and to facilitate it by giving them uh, option, you know, uh, resources in terms of materials that they can provide to their classes, exercises. So I think there are, and the teachers that I've encountered have been extremely receptive to this. And by the way, at every level, I think the youngest that I've yet had the privilege of speaking to are middle school. And I find that both, you know, anecdotally, the teachers and the students very responsive, I mean, hungry for opportunities to uh, stimulate debate and, and thought and discussion. And um, they're, they're so grateful for every uh, effort to facilitate that. Well, at the university level, which is where you know, I spend most of my life, universities spend, you can tell what their priorities are, what the values of the university <laughs> are. Sports. Uh, by, <laughs> by what the presidents speak about and what they emphasize yeah. during uh, yeah. orientation week. Mm -hmm. And my unempirical impression mm -hmm. is that values of free speech and the idea that one actually profits from hearing contrary views is has dropped from 
the, the agenda. That's a real no university president would, would ever say that they disapprove of that. Yeah. That's but they don't but they don't put it on the agenda with some exceptions. And yeah. so last year, uh, Princeton University, mm -hmm. led by, by the way, one of my former students, I'm proud to say, uh, assigned as the book that all incoming freshmen would read, Keith Whittington's yeah. book on, on campus free speech. It's a terrific book. And so that was the book that was the focus of every single incoming Princeton uh, student. I love that. Mm -hmm. That really does tell the students, uh, you know, this is a priority, but that was so much of an exception. I just, yeah. I don't know of any other institution that has uh, Washington uh, that University has done that. this year. <laughs> Oh, did they, yes, did yes. they do this with and your actually book? There was, yes, there was an editorial in the Wall Street Journal that um, uh, singled out Wash U. It didn't mention me, that's fine, but um, it gave a list of what the typical books are that are being assigned, and they're very different. And they support, and, and they support values that are also the ones that are emphasized at orientation, which are values that I deeply support. Uh, e equality and dignity and diversity and inclusivity and you know fostering a sense of inclusion and belonging for people who have traditionally been marginalized but it should not be at the expense of free speech to the contrary I believe that the two go hand in hand and so I do want to uh, completely echo Michael that there ha and there are organizations that have now put together model orientation materials uh, that can be used. And they're not just lecturing at, but they're very, they're exercises, they involve students, they include students. I have friends now who are working on uh, similar, similar modules, not only at the high school and lower level, but for the introduction of each course, materials for faculty members, very engaging videos and so forth laying out the importance of free speech and open inquiry and setting that as a tone for every single course. So when you're talking to college presidents that you support, this is a question to ask. You know, what, what do you emphasize at uh, orientation? Uh, how about something encouraging uh, students to think of opposing speech as a good thing and not a bad? I think maybe we have room time for one more of our, these questions. This is a provocative mm -hmm. one. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center quickly labels groups they don't like hate groups. What are your thoughts on them and how can you respond to their power? I've actually gone on the record about this. I know I've been quoted in a couple of media outlets because um, among other organizations and individuals that in my view, the SPLC, whose work I strongly support in general, but they're not perfect any more than any other organization, including a certain four-letter uh, organization that I've referred to earlier. So I believe very strongly in criticizing when they violate what I think their own policies, uh, not to mention neutral and fair principles are. So I was actually asked by the ADF, the Alliance Defending Freedom, a um, re re traditional religious organization that has been on the other side of the ACL. And that has been labeled as a hate and, and organization. And they were labeled by SPLC as a hate organization. And just to give you an example, in the famous Cake case before the Supreme Court, uh, ADF literally was representing the baker who refused to bake a case, arguing that, the cake, arguing that case in the Supreme Court. And ACLU literally was on the other side. Uh, representing the couple that wanted, the same-sex couple that wanted to buy the cake. And I've had many other disagreements with them. They actually wrote a book many years ago called ACLU Against America, but they are not a hate group. Uh, they are preaching, I, I know, out of love. It's the opposite of hate. And much as I may hate certain ideas, I, that's, I don't even like that word, disagree with certain ideas, uh, it is completely misleading, and if I believed in such a thing as defamation, defamatory, uh, to label them as such. And I'm happy to say that, and I think the same is true. They've um, mislabeled and, in fact, were successfully sued for defamation. Uh, certain members of uh, the Islam faith or former members who dare to critique it, um, to, to have labeled them to be Islamophobic. So um, I don't like to judge any organization or individual by the worst thing that they have done. 
uh, a Southern Poverty Law Center still does a tremendous amount of positive work, including uh, an excellent um, brochure. Well, I'm, so, I'm not supposed to talk about that organization. So just to say, you know, some of what they do is terrific. That was, I think, very strongly subject to criticism. So please uh, join me in thanking Nadine, not only for being with us this morning, but for her book and all that she's done. <laughs>